Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, think about a time when, when you were so excited that you just couldn't contain yourself. We, uh, Pastor Charnell and I and some others, had the pleasure of being witness to one of those a couple weeks ago when our early childhood kids put on their Christmas program here. And I, I had my attention as I watched, in particular, uh, two little girls who were on either side of the chancel over here. You know, in getting a one and a half, two, two and a half year old kid to, to focus for any length of time is kind of like getting a cat to sit down and stand up on command. I mean, right, it's, it's um, and yet, these little girls, and I know both of their parents, and I know the girls are, right, I mean, they're always having to figure out a way to get them, and yet, the word of God and the music, right, and these, these little girls and the others gathered around were just about to come out of their skin and keeping in time and speaking the words. It was, it was a glorious thing. My prayer for you all as you, as you hear the word today and as you hear it sung to us that you, you experience a little bit of that joy. For God comes to us by his grace. And that, that grace, that forgiveness does give us joy. Mary, for example. We're told by St. Luke that in those days, that is, shortly after the angel of the Lord visited Mary and told her that she would be the mother of the Savior of the world, that Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. Commentator Russell Saltzman notes, it was a 90-mile walk to the village of Ein Karen, which is the traditional birthplace of John the Baptist, which is about five miles to the southwest of Jerusalem. Mary traveled alone, Luke implies, though likely with a caravan, and she was newly pregnant, so think morning sickness. What St. Luke calls the hill country, other references call the Judean mountains. This was not a walk in the park. That 90-mile walk, roughly the equivalent of walking from here to the Wisconsin Dells, albeit on dirty, dusty, stony roads, and in hot desert conditions, that walk, likely with morning sickness, and over several days, would have given Mary a lot of time to think, to ponder, and to fear. Because as a supposed adulteress under the laws of Israel that time, she could be stoned to death. But then Mary entered the home of Zechariah, and she greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that there would be a fulfillment of what has spoken to her from the Lord. And so in a moment, the marvel, the wonder, the, the fear disappears and there is joy. And did you hear Elizabeth's confession? Right, We're told by St. Luke that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. That is not about her emotional state. This is not an emotion. Elizabeth knows that she is pregnant in her old age. And right, if you remember the story of how that announcement came to her priest husband, Zechariah, and she is six months along now, it is impossible to imagine, even though Zechariah is still mute and not able to speak, it's impossible to imagine that in those six months he hadn't somehow communicated to his wife what had happened to him when he was in the temple and who that baby in her womb was, that he was the one sent by God to prepare the way for the Savior of the world. Elizabeth and Zechariah know that the Messiah is coming, right? And furthermore, this is a priestly family. They, they know the scriptures, the promises, right, of, of where this child would be born and who would, he would be descended from. And so Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit, knew that the child in Mary's womb 
is the very Son of God who was sent to save them. And so again, she says, why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Jesus is this big in the womb of Mary. And yet Elizabeth confesses that child to be her Lord. And the infant, John the Baptist, leaps for joy. Both of these are confessions of faith. For that baby in the womb is a living soul. And his leaping for joy in faith is, is no less a confession of faith than those two little girls that I was talking about who couldn't articulate it yet, but they knew that Jesus was coming and they rejoiced in the privilege of being able to share that with those who were gathered that night. John the Baptist leaping for joy is no less a confession of faith than that of Caleb Sherrill. Caleb Sherrill's the brother of my seminary classmate, Adrian Sherrill. Caleb has Down syndrome. My, my friend Adrian's firstborn died in the womb just three weeks before she was due. We had her funeral, and I remember the gravesite, right? Caleb Sherrill with Down syndrome gave what I, in my lifetime, may be the greatest expression of Christian grief that I will ever see. He held in his hands a handful of little crosses. And with great emotion and confession and what he could speak, he put those crosses in the grave. Caleb knew that death is evil and that God had raised his son Jesus from the dead, and that because Jesus was raised, his little niece Hannah too would be raised. And there was no doubt about it that Caleb believed that Jesus Christ would keep his promise. He couldn't articulate it, but man, was it clear. That's why Elizabeth and Mary and John the Baptist are filled with joy. They knew that God had sent his rescuer according to his promise. That baby, that little baby in Mary's womb would save the whole world from the perils of our sins. And friends, right, if you, if you read Luke 1, if you read just beyond what our gospel reading is today, you will hear Mary's response. Right? For after Elizabeth gave her response to Mary, then, then Mary it breaks out in prophetic song. My soul magnifies the Lord, what we call the Magnificat. And when John the Baptist was born, if you recall, his father Zechariah, who had been mute for months, breaks forth in, in prophetic song. Blessed be the Lord. Right? What we call in the Benedictus. When Jesus is born, the angels break forth in song. Gloria in excelsis. An old man, Simeon, in the temple, who was promised that he would not die before he beheld the Lord's Christ, and he held the Christ child in his hands, and he sang, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace, what the church has sung for centuries we call the Nunc Dimittis. There is something about music that is of God and when it is connected to the word it, it, music connected to the word speaks to us in a way often that words cannot and for good and for ill you know discordant music can can bear witness to an anguished soul and even contribute to that anguish but harmonious music combined with the word of God, right? It conveys it in a powerful way and lifts our spirit as it conveys to us the promises of God and the forgiveness of sins. It is, and here's your big word for the day, it is mellifluous. Mel is the Latin word for honey, plus the Latin verb fluere, which means to flow. Sweet flowing words like honey. And indeed, today that is for us. 
for we are reminded again that God has kept his promise. That God sent his Savior to bear our sins, right? To be, live under the law for us, to live a perfect life for us, to die for you, for all, and to rise victorious over death. It was God's will to forgive our sins that gives us peace. As Hebrews tells us, by that will, we have been sanctified to the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for everyone. And so, in conclusion, especially to you choir and musicians today, like Mary or like many others, right, I suspect there are a lot of us here today that are on a journey that we didn't necessarily want to be on or weren't prepared for, and some of us are filled with fear. Some of us are about to begin a journey, and it's going to be trouble for us, and we don't know where it's going to go. We, and we don't even know this journey has begun. Maybe some of you who sing and play are yourselves dealing with stuff, and yet I want you to know that the word that you speak, that comes from your lips, the, the, the sounds that come from the work of your hands convey the word of God in a way that, that perhaps words alone can't. And so like Mary and Joseph and Elizabeth and Zechariah and John the Baptist and Simeon, the words that come from your mouths help us in a more profound way to grasp the truth that God has kept his promise and he forgives us and he sets us free and gives us the peace that passes understanding. You musicians, we thank God for you because through you, you remind us that God has come to us by his grace and that grace gives us joy. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.